Namaste, and welcome to another episode of Uladu Narpadu. Now, Narpadu means a specific poetic form in classical Tamil poetry. And Uladu has many shades of meaning, but what it comes down to is the way it is, the reality. Of course, we know that the world is the way it is, because that's the way it is, right? <laughs> and we have to accept that. But what we usually don't accept is that the way it is, is that the ego is false and illusory. The whole world is in the business of manufacturing a false ego and blowing it up into the biggest thing possible. Isn't it? So when we encounter a teaching like Ramana's, it really cuts the ego down to size. And so the ego is definitely going to feel pinched by it. And many people will reject it. Other people will deliberately misunderstand it, uh, the ones that are a little more clever. And the really clever ones will embrace it and go deep into it until they get the result. So, this verse begins a series of three verses about knowledge, specifically how we get our knowledge, our quality of knowledge. This is usually known as epistemology. How do we know what we know? So, let's look into the verse. Without ignorance about objects, which is dense like darkness, knowledge about objects does not exist. Similarly, without knowledge about objects, that ignorance does not exist. Only the knowledge gained by inquiring to whom are that knowledge and ignorance, which knows the non-existence of the individual self, the ego, who is the base of knowledge and ignorance about objects, is true knowledge. So, the TLDR here is, what is seen reveals the nature of the seer. The ego is false. And so, what it sees is knowledge and ignorance. And that knowledge and ignorance is also false. It's relative. And it's based on a false premise, which is the existence of the individual. So, knowledge and ignorance form a dyad, a set of complementaries, both abstractions. And both assume the nature of the self, or the ego, to be real. That's self with a small s, <laughs> because it's temporary. And it is also an abstraction. So today I've been, I've been waiting for a chance, actually, to go into the Buddha's explanation of how the ego is created. And you know, many times Ramana compared it to a, a movie projector and consciousness to a screen. So the projector is projecting many, many still frames per second. And then the consciousness is reflecting them the way it reflects everything that you put in front of it. But in this case, it creates the illusion that the I has real existence or permanent existence. So let's take a look at the Mula Pariyaya Sutta. Mula Pariyaya means the root structure. And here we're going to display the root structure as a pyramid. The reason for that is each layer, each stage of the pyramid uh, builds upon the, lowest, the next lower one until at the top 
you have the ego, the I. And so uh, when we first experience something, we experience it as immediate experience. Immediate experience means raw sense data. The eyes see a form. I'm going to use the example of a car. So you're walking along the street and here comes a car. And the first thing that your eyes see is simply the form of the car, the shape of the car. This is called immediate experience. Immediate experience has no conceptual component. It's raw sense data. It's a sensation. The sensation of seeing in this case. So we're seeing this car and the eyes simply take in the light and deliver it to the brain and it's like here it is. So that is the foundation, that sense data, that impression, that perception is the foundation of the mula pariyaya, the root structure of the mind. Ramana points out that the root thought is I, the root thought of the mind. So now we're going to see how this sense of I am, the false sense of I am as ego, I am this body, is constructed. The next layer is called reflexive experience, and that forms a superstructure that lays on top of the foundation of direct perception or immediate experience. And in the beginning, the thought of I and mine is implicit. In other words, it's not directly stated. But by the end, it becomes explicit, I and mine. And what this is, is actually the ontic view of the process of I making and mind making. And the ontic means as actually experienced, as opposed to ontological, which means a system that describes our experience. So ontic experience is directly from the senses, but in ego consciousness, we overlay a superstructure of I and mind. And now we're going to see exactly how this takes place. So there we are walking down the street and we see a car. So what happens? In the first step, recognition, we recognize that this is a car or maybe a specific kind of car. Why is that? We have some memories in our mind of other cars or maybe even of the same car. And when we see it, we recognize it. We assign a label to it. This is such and such a car. This is a desirable type of car or an undesirable type of car, as it may be. So then what happens? The second step is we conceive the car. In other words, we take all of the tags, the semantic labels that we associate with that particular car, whether by direct perception or from memory. And we form that into a gestalt. We conceive this thing called car as a complete experience. In other words, something in relation with I. And now this has become a constellation of immediate experience along with the reflexive experience of attaching a bunch of tags to it. So then what? Then the third stage is that we conceive in X. We conceive in the car the thought I and mine. We project, in other words. When you conceive something, it's like conceiving a child. Something new arises that wasn't there before. In the original perception of the car, there was no I or mine. It was just the car, or actually just the form. 
then we come up with the label car when we recognize it, and then we attach so many other labels by association. And then finally, we project I and mine into the car, into the object, whatever it might be. That wasn't there before. The car, as it is, doesn't have any conception of I and mine. We add it, we conceive it, and we project it into the car. Then what? Fourth step is we conceive from X. We conceive from the car. We imagine ourself in the car. We imagine that the car is mine. We imagine ourselves maybe driving down the street and waving to all the pretty girls from our wonderful car. We begin to fantasize about it. We begin to imagine what it would be like to have such a car or to experience such a car. And so you see, this rapidly turns into a dream movie which runs in our mind that we conceive on the basis of or in relation to the ego, I and mine. So then what? We acquire the car. Uh, does that mean we go and buy it or take possession of it? No. It means we assume the car is mine. This is my car. Uh, it's like, I want this car. I'm going to have this car. This is my car. This is the kind of car I was meant to have. I'm entitled to have this car. This car is the perfect car for me. It's all mine. But of course, that is just a dream, a waking dream. But this is the sum and substance of our entire experience in egoic consciousness. Therefore, it is said that the ordinary state of mind is an illusion, a dream from which we must awaken. And finally, the last step is we enjoy the car. Huh? Even if we don't actually physically possess it, we think we own it. And so we imagine ourselves in all kinds of situations in relation to the car. And we make up all kinds of stories about it. Huh? And maybe we even share them with others and so on, telling them all about our wonderful car. This is how most people live every day. They talk about my body, myself, my hair, my feelings, my job, my family, my relationships, my this, my that, on and on and on and on. And that's all they think about. Everything is in relation to I. And this is the root structure, the mula pariyaya, the root of the mind. Now this root has to be cut. Well, what does that mean? This process has to be stopped. And the key to stopping this process is simply to become aware of it. If you can observe this process in yourself, if you're sane, you'll be so embarrassed that you won't be able to keep doing it. You'll have to write, make it right and say, no, actually, the car is not mine. Actually, I probably can't even afford it. And actually, I'm not going to identify with that car because it has nothing to do with me. Huh? This I is nothing but a fantasy. It's simply a dream that I project on the actual reality. And so I've been living in a dream. But I'm not going to do that anymore because that's stupid. So when we get tired of being stupid, we look into it and we realize how we're creating this dream, this movie. Huh? The movie is already there in the inputs from the senses. And it's like then we're adding subtitles. <laughs> a dream within a dream. The body and the senses are already a dream because they're impermanent, as we talked about several episodes ago. They don't have actual reality because they come and go. At least they come and go 
every night when you go to sleep and then they wake up in the morning and they come back. So they're not real any more than your dreams while sleeping are real. Therefore, to add another dream on top of that is even more aberrating and more unconscious and more stupid. <laughs> so look into it in yourself. See it for yourself. See for yourself how your mind is built on this mula parayaya, this root structure. And give it up already. Stop cheating yourself and stop cheating others by claiming this body, this mind, this life, and so on and so on, is I and mine. And wake up from the dream. Om Tatsa. Om Harihi Om.